Hi everyone, welcome to the podcast. My name is Dr. Mark Eatonson. I'm a licensed psychologist and author specializing in the treatment of pathological narcissism. Uh, my book is called Unmasking Narcissism, A Guide to Understanding the Narcissist in Your Life. It's a compassionate guide to understanding the psychology of narcissism, and you can find it for sale on amazon.com and at major book retailers. I'll also put a link in the description below. So today I'd like to talk about integration. Pathological narcissism is really a condition in which different parts of the self are not integrated. As I've touched on in other episodes, this is thought to be due to early experiences of relational trauma and emotional neglect that overwhelm the developing self with feelings that can't really be incorporated into the individual's identity and self-image, creating the need for defensive adaptations that protect the child's identity from being overwhelmed by negative representations of the self and also of other people on whom the child relies. When we're young, we're especially dependent on our attachment relationships to provide safety and shelter from emotionally overwhelming and distressing experiences. Young children cling to a caregiver when they hear a loud noise or when they see something that frightens them, whenever they feel distraught. But the sorts of overwhelming experiences that are thought to cause pathological narcissism typically occur within the context of the very attachment relationships on which children rely for safety and reassurance. And this leaves the child stuck. For example, the child may feel enraged at a caregiver, but the only way of coping with such a strong and overwhelming and frankly frightening feeling is to seek the safety and reassurance uh, of the very same caregiver uh, with whom they feel enraged. And similarly, a young child may feel ashamed or humiliated by an insensitive caregiver, but have nowhere to turn for help in dealing with those feelings. In order to protect the attachment relationship with their parent, the child begins to uh, split off parts of the developing self. You know, if, if mom's not an emotionally safe person, but the child has to rely on mom for emotional safety, then their only choice is to begin to cut themselves up into separate pieces in order to protect their ability to rely on mom even though she isn't safe. Uh, the good memories and the good feelings are kept walled off and separate from the bad memories and the bad feelings. In effect, this creates two internal models of mom and two corresponding self-images. And this is the origin of splitting and the discontinuity of internal experience that is frequently encountered in all personality disorders, NPD included. The personality develops around the imperative that attachment relationships must be protected, even if it comes at the expense of the self. I once saw a parent uh, handle this sort of thing uh, beautifully. Their toddler was clearly angry with them, uh, even hitting the parent on the arm. And the parent caught the toddler's arm and sternly said, no, no hitting. And the look on the toddler's face was one of competing emotions. The toddler was enraged at their parent, they were ashamed at being reprimanded, and they were also in need of comfort. But how can you be comforted by the very same person who's causing you to feel the strong feelings of anger or hatred or shame in the first place? And this is the predicament of all young children. And here's what the parent did. They saw the look of shame and anger on the child's face and they mirrored it briefly with their own expression. Then they quickly shifted to a look of concern. And this gave the child a feeling that their emotional experience had been seen and comprehended by their caregiver. And then the parent said, are you mad at me? Because it's okay to be mad at me. And you can even say, I'm mad at you. And there was a look of relief on the child's face. The child said, I'm mad at you. And the parent said, see, you can use your words to tell me how you feel. You don't need to hit me because that hurts me and it makes me feel mad too. And the child said, okay. And then the parent checked in with the child to see if they wanted a hug and it turns out that they did. Now this simple interaction was a microcosm of the way that a good, empathically attuned parent or caregiver works within the attachment relationship to help their child learn to integrate opposite or overwhelming emotions. The child learns that the feelings of anger and the need for comfort can actually coexist and that both feelings can be seen and understood by the very person that the child is angry with. The parent's 
response provides an ability that the child lacks, the ability to hold opposing feeling states about the same object together at the same time. And it also provides an effective solution to the conflict, a hug, a literal embrace of all the parts of the child. Now this response, if repeated often enough during their first years of life, gets internalized, and the child learns to integrate their own internal states. This ability becomes a consistent source of flexible, moderate responsiveness to life's challenges. They learn to work out conflicts within the very relationships in which those conflicts occur. And they learn to recognize their conflicting feelings and to self-soothe more effectively. The psychoanalyst and pediatrician Donald Winnicott called this sort of responsiveness good enough mothering. A more accurate phrase would be good enough parenting because the relational matrix that produces a well-integrated self can be created and fostered by any caregiver, uh, a father, a grandparent, an adoptive or foster parent. It doesn't have to be a mother. Winnicott stressed the phrase good enough because he was aware that all parents lose their patience. Everyone gets busy or distracted and we all have our own challenges to overcome. Nobody's perfect, but luckily children are resilient. In one training I attended for something called mentalization-based therapy or MBT, which is a popular approach for working with personality disordered patients, the instructors estimated that caregivers need to be optimally responsive at least 30% of the time. Now I'm not sure where they got that figure. I assume it was based on empirical research, looking at attachment relationships over time, but whatever the case, the point that they were trying to make was that there's actually a lot of wiggle room. But eventually, in the absence of good enough parenting, a sort of critical mass is reached, and the child must instead rely on their own immature resources to cope. They attempt to keep their hateful or enraged or ashamed or dependent feelings separate from their loving, happy, idealizing feelings they learn to compartmentalize. These adaptations happen very early in the developing self, so early in fact that they may be entirely unconscious. The personality develops around the need to keep the vulnerable, depressed, angry, and ashamed feelings separate from the good feelings. And this is why pathological narcissism involves alternating states of vulnerability and grandiosity. For some individuals, the vulnerable state is more frequently present. And for others, maybe with more well-developed defenses, the grandiose feelings tend to hold sway. But for all individuals with pathological narcissism or NPD, there's a split in the self between good and bad self-images, good and bad feelings about others. And these splits inevitably influence relationships. When the narcissistic person is in a vulnerable state, Others are viewed through that lens. They're seen as cold, rejecting, insensitive, humiliating, critical, or unavailable. In a previous episode, I talked about resiliency. People with pathological narcissism and NPD have a very specific kind of resiliency. They develop a grandiose false self to help protect them from these irresolvable relational binds. When all of the bad feelings are put into one box, then all that's left are good feelings. The individual attempts to cling to these good feelings. The divisions in the self become like two rooms. One is filled with all the terrible stuff, but the other is filled with all the amazingly good stuff. Others are idealized. The self is seen as perfect or amazing or with limitless potential. And the person comes to feel like this good room with all this good stuff is where they really belong. That's who they, quote, really are. And we call this feeling the false self. The person tries with all their might to stay aligned with the grandiose and idealized self images that live in this false self and to avoid ever being identified with the bad feelings. These efforts tend to look like hypersensitivity to rejection or criticism in relationships, where any criticism is seen as an attempt to put the person in the, quote, bad room. And this is why individuals with NPD can be so reactive to perceived slights. If left to their own devices, a person stuck in this cycle of clinging to grandiosity and avoiding vulnerability will burn through relationship after relationship, always perceiving the other person as amazing and perfect in the beginning, 
Uh, I believe pop psychology calls this uh, love bombing. But it's not an intentionally manipulative process. It's a natural consequence of the internal divisions that exist within the self. Over time, the idealizations begin to get contaminated. The idealized person's imperfections begin to accumulate, as do the narcissist's own inadequacies and insecurities. The narcissistic individual increasingly begins to perceive the other person as attempting to sort of make them feel like the self that lives in the bad room with the unsolvable relational conflicts and negative feelings of rage, shame, and dependency. But instead of understanding that these issues actually live within the self and they're caused by splitting, the individual with NPD perceives them as the other person's failings. And eventually, the relationship becomes so fraught that the person is sort of discarded. At least, that's often how it feels. But from the narcissist's perspective, they simply discovered that the other person was never the perfect being they originally thought they were. The cycle repeats over and over. And this is where therapy and self-work become so important. Healing NPD means slowly, sometimes painfully, learning to integrate the split-off parts of the self. It means beginning to understand that nothing and nobody is perfect, including the self. The intoxicating highs of grandiose experience exist in such a pure and addictive form only because all of the bad stuff has been split off and compartmentalized into a different part of the self. The self is perceived as great and others are idealized because of a distortion in perception, not because anything is really that great. In object relations theory, which is a psychoanalytic school of thought, this realization is called the depressive position. And it represents the dawn of a new, more mature awareness and integration within the individual, where they begin to see themselves and other people as whole objects, combinations of good and bad qualities and feelings that can't be separated into good and bad parts. And this mode uh, of being represents the end of a certain kind of magical thinking, of the less mature defenses of splitting doing and undoing, projection and denial. The flaws in the self and in other people must be contended with. They can't be erased through distorted thinking or perceiving. The depressive position means working with what is rather than what we wish things were. But it also means uh, that we can no longer be sort of completely overwhelmed by bad self images or the feeling that others are persecutory or out to get us. We begin to see all people, ourselves included, as both good and bad, as necessarily imperfect. And just like the attuned parent could see both the hating and loving parts of the toddler and responded to each simultaneously, a person in the depressive mode of thinking, feeling, and perceiving can hold both vulnerable strivings and grandiose feelings at the same time. Yeah, it's a bit disappointing to lose those high highs, but the trade-off is getting to have real relationships and never again having to be stuck in that room full of split off badness. So how can you start on this path? Well, the next time you feel sort of on top of the world, try to regard that feeling a little bit skeptically. Notice if you tend to think to yourself something like, this is who I really am, when you feel that way. Try to remember that that feeling is actually a distortion. And just like a prism separates wavelengths of light into their pure colors, there's a mechanism inside of you that has separated your feelings and perceptions into their sort of pure wavelengths. The idealizations and the grandiosity that you experience are only part of the story. And if you can begin to have that awareness actively in the moment when you're feeling these feelings, then it might help to open the door just a little bit for some other parts of you to show up too. And the same thing goes for when you're in a vulnerable state. This too is not the sort of quote, real you. This represents uh, parts of your experience that have been split off and shoved into a dark corner of your personality. The grandiose experiences never last forever and neither do the vulnerable experiences. Try to think of these parts of you compassionately. Imagine the child I described earlier, caught between anger and the need for reassurance, between shame 
and the feeling of needing to be comforted. Try to see yourself as that child and imagine how you might respond to them if you were their caregiver. You'd probably do something like give them a hug. It might sound corny to talk about, you know, hugging your inner child, but it's a cliche for a reason. There's a part of you that needs help to integrate conflicting feelings. And at some point you learned that you can't be, quote, a good person and also feel depressed or angry or ashamed or dependent at the same time. At some point you began to separate those experiences, clinging to one and pushing the other away. And that strategy worked when you were young, but it's no longer viable. So long as you are clinging to the good feelings, you're constantly running from the bad ones. As in just about every story ever told, there comes a time when you must stop running, stop clinging to the preferred experience, turn around and face whatever's actually there. And I guarantee it's not the monster you imagine it to be. It's most likely a little child, hurt, angry, scared, or alone. It's the feeling of shame, humiliation, or disappointment. It's loss. Try to embrace that child and those feelings. Get as close to them as you can without allowing them to overwhelm you. Take baby steps toward that part of your experience that needs someone to see and to understand. A little compassion can actually go a very long way. Okay, so that's it for today. As always, please feel free to leave comments or questions or suggestions for future content. Uh, and until next time, take good care.